every tongue confess that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow at His name. He is the wonderful Counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. At the name of Jesus every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at His Jesus, every tongue confess. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow at His name. Every knee shall bow at His name. Every knee shall bow at His name. Of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us this morning. If you are a guest, thank you for being here today. That's a huge honor for us because you could have chosen to be anywhere in the world and you're here. And so we're very thankful for that. If you have any questions about anything that we say or do in our worship this morning, we'd love to sit down and have a conversation with you. If you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Just love to sit down and talk with you about what that means here and how we receive new members. We're just thankful that you chose to come our way. There is a card on the seat uh, right in front of you. You can fill that out. Uh, any prayer requests that you want to indicate, we'll be praying about those as early as this afternoon. So fill those out and put them in the collection plate, which will pass a little bit earlier in our service than usual. So kind of keep an eye out for that and get ready for it. Lisa and I give online. That's an option that you have. Uh, but if you give you know, in real time, just go ahead and get ready for it because it's coming real, real soon. Uh, also, just be aware that communion will come after the sermon this morning. So if you were planning on skipping out after the Lord's Supper, <laughs> so sorry, you got to hear the sermon too. Hey, let's stand, let's worship the Lord together. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Who paints the skies into glorious day? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who breathes his life into fists of clay? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who shapes the valleys and brings the rain? Only the splendor of Jesus. Who makes the desert to live again? Only the splendor of Jesus. He is wonderful. He is glorious. Full in righteousness. Full of tenderness. Come and worship Him. He's the Prince of Life. He will cleanse our hearts in His river of fire. Who hears the cry of the barren one? Holy of Jesus, who breaks the curse of the heart of stone, only the mercy of Jesus, who storms the prison and sets men free, only the mercy of Jesus, purchasing souls for eternity, only the mercy of Jesus. He is wonderful, He is glorious, full in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship Him, He's the Prince of Life. He will cleanse our hearts in His river of He is wonderful, He is glorious, full in righteousness, full of tenderness. Come and worship Him. He's the Prince of Life. He will cleanse our hearts in His river of fire. Jesus. Jesus. Holy and anointed one. Jesus.
to my soul. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Jesus, I love you. I love you. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And? He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile himself to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The blood of Jesus speaks for me. Be still my soul, redeeming love. Out of the dust of Calvary, his rising to the throne above, there is no is 
So I want to say a word real quick about uh, the meeting that we had yesterday. Um, I heard really great things about, it's called a, an appreciative inquiry, where we sit down together and think and pray about who God is calling us to be as a church. And I just heard a lot of really good stuff about that. Uh, first meeting yesterday, uh, so many of you went to that, and then uh, many of others of you were scheduled for uh, a meeting in a couple of weeks, uh, in a couple of Sundays from now, September. Uh, Lincoln will give you a little more details on that in just a second. But here's a couple of things I've heard. I've, I've heard a couple of people tell me this. They've said, <clears throat> you know, we did this before. We've done this before. And so I'm just not sure that it's really worth doing again or if anything's ever going to change. Uh, so I want to say two things about that. 
first of all, I just want to, I want to challenge the idea that we have done this before. We have not done this before. I've been here about 30 minutes, and this church has changed in the last three years, a lot. We're different than we were when Lisa and I came in 2015. So we have not done this before. Now we are doing this because new people have come in, other people have left. Some people didn't like the preacher, so whatever. <laughs> so we've got new folks and we're, we're different. Even, even if we had not added anybody or lost anybody, we would still be different than we were. I hope we would, we've grown, haven't we, spiritually? So in that sense, it's not accurate to say that we have done this before. Here's the other thing. This town has changed. Just in the last, in the last two weeks, this, t this town has changed. Did you know that the, the South Huntsville Business Association has been spending a lot of money and doing a lot of thinking about how to rev revitalize the South Side? That's where we are. They're committed to, to making the South Side a destination place. That means more people are moving in. They're building a whole new neighborhood down near where I live, a whole brand new neighborhood down there close to the river. Those folks need somewhere to go to church. Our community is changing. We've changed. It's a great time for us to do this. So let's get on board with that. If you haven't signed up for this next meeting, please do it. I want to challenge you to do it. It's a really, really good thing for us to do. We're, gonna, we're, we're seeking the Lord to find out who he wants us to be in the next 20 years. So I hope you'll join us in that effort. Okay, I want to, just a little outside the box, okay? But it's okay. Uh, the quality of this is not going to be real good because it's coming through my phone. But I want to play you a song just a little bit, okay? And if you, if you know it, you can, you, can, you can sing along. Okay, you remember that? If you know the words, join in. They're easy. It, it's the Doobie Brothers. This is, remember this song? It's a great song. Jesus is just all right with me. Jesus. Okay, that's enough of that. I'm going to turn my phone down now. And some enterprising young teenager will call me in the middle of the sermon just to see what happens. <laughs> so the first time, here's the thing about that song. The first the song was written uh, and performed first by a group named the Art Reynolds Singers in 1966. And it was a part of the Jesus movement of the 70s, right? The whole Jesus rock and roll thing of the, of the 70s. That's kind of when that started. And how many have heard of the, the Art Reynolds group? Just curious. I'm totally not surprised. <laughs> okay. But in 1969, the British band, The Birds, covered it. How many of you remember The Birds? Right, because a bunch of y'all were hippies back then, right? Okay, so The Birds covered it, and then it went nowhere. But then in 1972, the Doobie Brothers, honey, somebody's calling me. Would you just take my phone? You're, you're, Lincoln's going on vacation. That's why he's wearing blue jeans today. When he comes back, he may not have an office, okay? <laughs> so in 72, the, the Doobie Brothers covered the song, and it was a huge hit in the U.S. And I remember when I first heard that song. I was in high school, and I was like, oh, the Doobie Brothers are singing about Jesus. They must be members of the Church of Christ, right? <laughs> Then I went, oh, wait, it was instrumental music. That's Christian church, so. Yeah. <laughs> but I was so pumped up that they were singing about Jesus. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Here's the benefit, young folks, this is, it's awesome where you are in life right now. It gets better. Because after you've been around for five or six decades, you get to look back on the past and you see trends, right? So in the 70s, I, I got to thinking about this and I thought, there was a bunch of Jesus music 
in the 70s. Jesus Rock in the 70s. You get Jesus Christ Superstar, I think around 71. You had uh, Spirit in the Sky. Uh, you had Put Your Hand in the Hand of the Man Who uh, Calmed the Waters. So there's all kind of Jesus stuff in the 70s. And then I said, well, I wonder if that kind of carried over into the 80s. And then I got to thinking about the 80s, and I realized that in the 80s, the, the symbol that was everywhere was the, the sign of the fish, right? The little, the little fish symbol. That's when that really took off in the 80s. It was sort of like Christians said, hey, we are not ashamed to be Christians. We're going to be out loud and proud, and we are culturally ascendant, and so we're going to put our little fish bumper stickers on our cars, and we're going to wear them on our t-shirts and our hats. We'll even get fish tattoos. We'll have fish jewelry. We're Christians, and we're proud of it, which is a little ironic because according to tradition, in the third or fourth century, the symbol of the fish, the sign of the fish, was countercultural. And it was revolutionary. And it was your way of saying, I am not on board with where the culture is. I am, I'm a rebel. Uh, and they would put that sign on, on buildings where Christians met because that was a secret way of saying, this is where we're going to meet uh, because the, the Roman government was persecuting them. There's even a, a, a story that if, if you were a Christian back in those days and you were walking down the road and you encountered another person on the way, that, and you started talking to them, if you drew with your foot, if you drew half of the fish in the sand and they drew the other half, then you'd know you were talking to a Christian. That's how they kind of identified each other. That was their secret handshake kind of thing. So it's just ironic that what used to be this idea of being a counter-revolutionary and counter-cultural was actually, you know, in the 80s, that was kind of, you know, we're on top of the culture. And then magazines in the 90s, every magazine had a picture of Jesus on the cover. He was on the cover of magazines more often than politicians were on the cover of magazines. Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report and Time and on and on and on. They all had pictures of Jesus over and over and over. And then by 2000, Business Week, the magazine Business Week, even had a, a title article called, It's Cool to Love Jesus. So Jesus was all popular through the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, and now he's still popular. I mean, everybody wants Jesus to be the spokesperson for their thing, right? The Huffington Post, December of last year, ran, a, ran an, a, a, an article, a post titled, Jesus was a Socialist. Christmas before that, 2015, CNN ran a post, Jesus was a refugee. I don't care what your political leanings are. You lean left, you lean right, lean right, you're straight down the middle. Everybody wants Jesus to be on their team. He is and always has been incredibly attractive, at least since his death and resurrection. More books have been written about him than anybody else in history. They've made movies about him. He is hands down the most iconic figure ever. And that's the problem. Jesus has become an icon, a pliable image turned, easily turned into a marketing device or mascot for everything from television shows to political movements to motion pictures. He can be your homeboy. He can be your good buddy. He can even be your boyfriend. He's useful. He's attractive. And he sells, which suggests that somewhere along the way, we miss the point on something really, really important. In the seminary, at, uh, in the library of Columbia Seminary in Atlanta, there, uh, there are pictures all around one of the rooms, uh, paintings of Jesus. And they're all done by different artists. There's a, a, a Chinese artist who painted Jesus and a Japanese artist who painted Jesus and a Nigerian artist and a Brazilian artist and Canadian and British and American and on and on and on. All these different artists from around the world painted Jesus. And the interesting thing is, that he looks exactly like the artist that painted him, or at least the, from, from the artist's country. Which in a way is not a bad thing, right? I mean, we, we sang a minute ago, and Paul said in Philippians 2 that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of the Father. So in a sense that, that you've got Jesus looking like all of these nationalities is good because Jesus is for everybody. But 
it kind of makes the point too that we've missed the point because God did not intend for him to be conformed to our image. He can, intended for us to be conformed to his. Of course, there's some benefits to having a, a practical and versatile version of Jesus. He's accessible. He's amiable. He's attractive. He's tolerant. He's kind. Truth is, Jesus can be whatever you want him to be. And I'm not just talking about people in the world. I'm talking about us. The church has always tried to spin Jesus. We've always wanted Jesus to be cool because everybody likes the cool kids and if they like Jesus, they'll like us. We forget that God didn't come here so that people would like us. God didn't send Jesus to make us look good. He sent Jesus to help us be good. And the problem with spinning Jesus is that he never stays spun. The real Jesus is too honest and he's too original. And here's a word you probably never hear used about Jesus, but you should because it's as true of him as any other word you could use. Jesus is dangerous. See, the way we sometimes try to present him, I think reminds me of those pharmaceutical commercials. You've seen, you've seen these on TV, right? Whoever made that okay to do that should be taken out and done something with. Those are horrible. You got all these, all these shiny, happy people and they're frolicking in the sun and they're radiating health and happiness and they're with beautiful people and they have great relationships and their finances are all in good shape and they have all of these great things because they've taken this drug and if you'll take this drug, you'll be a shiny, happy person too and you'll radiate, radiate health and happiness as you frolic in the sun with beautiful loved ones if you'll just take this drug. And then, toward the end of the commercial, an actor in a doctor smock comes on and says, now, some people experienced headache and dizziness and disorientation and constipation and diarrhea and became Gator fans. <laughs> Started to say Auburn or Alabama fans, but I tried one of those jokes here about three years ago and it didn't work. I'm thinking maybe we need to do that with Jesus. I think, we, I think we tell people that Jesus is the answer to all their problems, that he will fix what's broken and he will give you purpose and meaning and he will forgive your past and assure your future and all of that is true, that's quite true, but we should add this disclaimer, he will do all of those things for you but he will also confront you about your addiction to sin. He will require you to repent. That means to change. Because however he finds you is not how he's going to leave you. He will expect you to actively love people you would rather hate. He will expect you to humbly serve people you would rather neglect. And he will expect you to faithfully forgive people you'd rather hold a grudge against. And on top of all of that, he's going to require your total allegiance even if allegiance to him means death, and in some times and places it does. Besides the blatant falsehood of it all, there's a fatal danger in creating an adjustable Jesus. Because in, in, when we reinvent him to be more marketable, more like us, we render him powerless to make us like he truly is. We wind up not only with a harmless Jesus, but a culturally housebroken Christianity. A domesticated Jesus does not create a dynamic church. And that's really the message this morning. How we see Jesus determines who we become. Jesus and the church are so interrelated that in Ephesians 5, Paul compared their relationship between Jesus and the church to a husband and a wife. Now, this is kind of off topic, but this is a good place to just to remind you of something. You've heard people kind of go, well, I, I really like Jesus, but I don't want anything to do with the church. That may be kind of where you are, right? You love Jesus, not real fond of his church. You don't have that luxury. You just don't. Paul said that the relationship between Jesus and his church is like that of a husband and a wife. It'd be like saying to Lisa, we really love for you to come over Friday night to have dinner with us, but don't bring Jody. We just don't like him. I'm, she would say no, right, baby? <laughs> <laughs> I 
So it just can't, now it's even more visceral than that though. Because Paul also said that the church is the body of Christ. That's how interrelated we are. Now, back on point here, the thing is, when there's something wrong with the church, that 99.9% of the time means there's something wrong with the way the church sees Jesus. We're so interconnected that if our vision of Christ isn't right, our vision of church isn't going to be right either. The the problems with ecclesiology are always problems with Christology. To fix the church, to fix ourselves, we have to start not with the organization, not with the institution, and not even with the the, the lifestyle choices of the person. you got to start with who Jesus is, the way we see Christ. So nearly nearly over 2,000 years ago, there was a man named John who was living in exile on an island off the coast of Turkey called Petmos. John, author of the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, John the Apostle. He was was on this this island because he he had been imprisoned there for the way he saw Jesus. Everybody else said, Caesar is Lord, and John was like, no, Jesus is Lord. So he was was exiled to the island of Petmos. He's there on on one Sunday morning, and he has this vision during, during a time of personal worship He has this vision of the glorified Christ, and Jesus gives him a message that is at once terrifying and comforting, confrontational, and encouraging. He's ordered by Jesus to write down the vision and send it to seven churches, which are scattered throughout what is now Turkey. At that time, the strongest point of Christian influence in the Roman Empire, but that's not to say that those churches were either dominant or healthy. Most of them were a mess. And those that weren't a mess were undergoing great persecution. And so through these seven letters, Jesus confronted the problems those churches faced. So over the next seven Sunday mornings, you and I are going to read their Gmail. We're going to read these seven letters to these churches from God. We're actually going to try and do more than that. We're going to try to walk into their worship services and sit down with them and feel both the comfort and the confrontation that Jesus offers. And with those original readers, you and I as a group and you and I as individuals will have to decide if we have the courage and faith to follow the real Jesus, not some affected, airbrushed fabrication. I can tell you that these letters are not easy to read. And I don't mean that they're hard to understand. They're not really that hard to understand. They're not easy to read because they're blunt and they're direct. But the letter's not the first thing we see in Revelation. The first thing we see is a description of the one who sent the letters. So I want to begin there this morning in in, in Revelation chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you to stand for this reading, please. Just listen with me. But I want us to stand as we hear this word because you'll you'll see why. Revelation chapter 1 verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion of the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. On the Lord's day, I was in the spirit, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet which said, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned I saw seven golden lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe reaching down to his feet with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance. And When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he placed his right hand on me. And he said, we'll look at what he said in just a minute. Let's pray. Lord, bless us with a vision of Christ that is true and honest and accurate and real and terrifying and dangerous and comforting all at once. Help us see Jesus for who he really is 
and not who we want him to be. Help us to see Jesus for who he really is so that we can be made like him. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can have a seat. Most of the time when folks venture into the book of Revelation, they're looking to, to decipher every single symbol. It's, we're not going to do that. It's kind of like trying to unweave a rainbow. Uh, John's purpose here in describing Jesus is not to try and give us uh, an accurate physical description of his appearance. He is inviting what Rubel Shelley called a response of overwhelming and annihilating wonder. By the way, a couple of good commentaries on Revelation for you. Rubel Shelley's uh, The Lamb and His Enemies, and then a pretty old book, I think from the 50s or so, Ray Summers. Ray Summers, Worthy is the Lamb. The Lamb and His Enemies by Shelley, Worthy is the Lamb by Ray, uh, by Ray Summers. So we're not going to try and, and decipher all these, but there are some symbols that we do want to unpack. The seven letters are going to address some serious problems in the church. But before John wants to talk about those, he's got to give these churches a truer, grander vision of Jesus. I think we need that too. We, we need it as a church and we need it as individuals. What you think about Jesus, how you see Jesus, how we see him is going to determine who you become, who we become. So John sees this amazing, terrifying figure standing among seven golden lampstands. Think of a menorah. And in verse 20, John explains that the lampstands are the churches. And that kind of makes sense, right? Jesus said the church is like a light shining in the darkness, the city set on the hill. But John's not focused on the churches, on the candles. He's focused on the one standing among them, Jesus. In verse 13, John says that he's dressed in a long robe, long robe with a, with a golden sash around his chest. That sounds like what kings or priests would wear. So if you're looking for the symbolism there, it has to do with authority. It has to do with authority to rule and authority to represent people to God and God to people. So that's who Jesus is. John says his hair was white like wool, which in apocalyptic literature is purity or, or wisdom or both. And then he says his eyes were like blazing fire. He sees everything. When we were kids, my brother and I were convinced, and we didn't use this word because we didn't know this word at the time, but we were convinced that my mother was omniscient. She knew everything. She saw everything. We got away with nothing. We were, my nearest brother and I once were huddled over something in our backyard. We discovered something in our backyard and we were both squatted down, huddled over it, poking it with sticks. I think we knew intuitively that it might be dangerous. So out of nowhere, you know on Star Trek how they just kind of appear? My mother did that. She just, all of a sudden she appeared and the, she asked the question that was the most oft, question around, most oft asked question around my house, what are you two doing? That was the question. And we said, hey mom, look at these funny worms. They coil up and they stick their tongues out at you. Remember the first time you ever rode a roller coaster? Remember that? And when they hit the button and, and all of a sudden you feel that force, right? That's called G-force. Feel it when you take off on an airplane to you, that G-force. First time I ever felt G-force was when my mother grabbed the back of my shirt and the back of my brother's shirt, because he felt it too, and she threw us across the backyard. <laughs> I think they call that, what do they call that, the clean or the jerk, whatever they call that lift. She threw us across the backyard. And when we recovered from blacking out from the G-force, the first thing we saw was my mom wielding a shovel, screaming, die, you little forked tongue devils. And we chose to believe she was talking about the snakes. <laughs> so there was another time, I have to be careful how I tell this part of the story because children. Um, we, my brother and I poured a common household accelerant into empty Coke bottles and stuffed rags inside of them to make incendiary devices that we'd seen on the Rat Patrol. Okay, mom again, materialized. What are you two doing? And probably saved our lives. Here's this, the thing about this blazing eyes Jesus, okay? Here's what we think. Oh, here we go with that old hard-shell Baptist or hardline Church of Christ. He sees everything you do. 
He's the all-seeing eye watching you. And yes, Jesus sees everything you do. He does. So if you're up to something and you think only you and God know it, well, you're right. God knows it. But here's the flip side of that. If something's after you, he knows it. He sees it. He's just like my mom. He, can, he, he sees everything. So if you were one of those churches in Asia that was suffering persecution, that was a really comforting thought. And that may be a really comforting thought for you this morning. That, that Jesus has the eyes of blazing fire, that he sees exactly what's going on. He knows who's trying to hurt you. He knows what's trying to hurt you. And he has the power to do something about it. That could be really good news for you this morning. Or it could be something that you want to think about because if you think only you know about it, you're not the only one. He sees it too. So John sees the eyes of blazing fire and then uh, he, John sees these feet of bronze. He sees these, these glowing feet of bronze glowing in a furnace, which makes me think of feet of clay, right? You heard the news this past week about the Catholic Church in Philadelphia. Maybe you read the news about Willow Creek Church and the struggles they're having. We've all known church leaders who let us down. I've been one of those. What John is saying is, people have let you down before because they have feet of clay. Jesus doesn't. His feet are like bronze. He will never let you down. And then there's the voice. It was like the sound of rushing waters. I love the part where John says, I turned around to see the voice. Who turns around to see a voice? I mean, that must have been something substantial, like substantive. He must have thought it was a, 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 not just a thing that you heard, but a thing that you could see because he wanted to turn around and see the voice. He said it was like rushing waters. Ask people in New Jersey what that's like. They've had a recent experience with it. And in his right hand, John says, he holds seven stars. Most of the interpreters think that refers to the destiny of the seven churches. He's got the whole church in his hand. And then finally, the most, the strangest and most unsettling piece is the, out of his mouth comes this double-edged sword. Swords symbolize judgment. And after all of that, it's no wonder that John writes in verse 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. John was terrified. Well, who wouldn't be? Now compare that to your version of Jesus. Compare that vision to the one you picture in your mind when you hear the name Jesus. This is a visceral Jesus. Powerful, majestic, dignified, direct, holy, wise, all-knowing, all-seeing, impossible to ignore. This Jesus is standing among his churches to comfort and to confront. This Jesus will not be domesticated. He will not be tamed. He will not be leashed. He will not be caged. He will not be used. He will not be adjusted to make himself more marketable to the culture. He will not be reduced to a few letters on a t-shirt or a symbol on a bumper sticker or a bracelet. And he will not become the decoration on some political party's platform. And I'm talking about your party, whichever one it is. He is not for sale to independents or Democrats or Republicans or Libertarians or Communists or Socialists or anybody else. He stands on his own two feet, and he will not be taken in vain. He won't, and he won't settle for the world thinking he's just all right. This is a Jesus to be reckoned with. And he is powerful enough to care for and deliver his people when they need to be cared for and delivered. And I guess maybe if we stop right there... Maybe we leave and never come back. I mean, that's a pretty intimidating vision. But there's one more thing John saw that you need to see. It's verse 17. John said, I fell down like, like I was dead. And then he says, he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Hey, uh, Lincoln, you guys want to come on back up? 
Um, do you remember the Chronicles of Narnia, C.S. Lewis? When the children first meet the king of Narnia, Aslan, they ask, is he safe? And the answer comes back, of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Listen, don't settle for a wimpy, safe Jesus. He can't save you. You want the real thing. You want a Jesus that is dangerous and strong and good. Because if that's not the king, then you and I won't be good or safe unless we have him. We're going to enter into a time of communion now. I want to lead us in a prayer, and then we'll share our time of remembering Jesus and all that he has done for us and who he is. So bow with me. Let's pray. All holy God, how beautiful is the work of your hands. When sin scarred the world, you entered into covenant to renew your whole creation. As a mother tenderly gathers her children, as a father joyfully welcomes his, you embraced a people as your own and filled them with longing for a peace that would last and for justice that would never fail. Through countless generations, your people hungered for the bread of freedom. From them, you raised up Jesus, your son, the living bread, in whom all hungers are satisfied. He healed the sick, though he himself would suffer. He offered life to sinners, though he knew he would give his life for ours. But with a love stronger than death, he opened wide his arms and surrendered his spirit. And on the night before he met with death, he came to the table with those he loved, as he comes to the table now with those he loves. He took bread and praised you, God of all creation. He broke bread with his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
pray again. Holy Father, when the supper was ended, he took wine and thanked you, God of all creation. He said, take this, all of you, and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we remember. Help us never to forget. In Jesus' name, amen. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star, and throughout
have come to exalt you this morning. And it is our prayer that our exaltation has been a sweet sound to you. That our praise has been an aroma that was pleasing to you. And that our spirit of humbleness and need has been a sign of our true felt love for you. And we ask that as we consider the sacrifice of your son for us, that we would love you more every day for your amazing grace. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name and all that agree say, amen. amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is amazing grace. This is a failing love. This is a failing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. That I would be set free. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Whoa, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amen. Another great morning. Even in spite of your preaching, it's still another great morning. <laughs> I got one. Did you call me? <laughs> good morning, guys. Really, really good morning. Glad you're here. A couple things as we close. Uh, wedding shower today, 1.30 to 3 in the Mercy Building for James and Tabitha Smeal. Uh, Tabitha Bell and James Smeal, so remember that this afternoon. Uh, we do need volunteers to help start tearing down the gym today. As soon as we conclude here... Cody Smith and Walton Harless will be um, overseeing that. 
And as Jody mentioned, we did have a great meeting yesterday. It was really interesting. The time flew by. Couldn't believe that it was gone when it was over. And I really encourage you to sign up for September the 9th. You also get a free lunch. But we need you to sign up so that we know that we have enough lunches. So please do that. I guarantee you it's time well spent. You will not be sorry um, that you went to that second vision congregational meeting. Thanks for being here today. Hope you have a great week. And we will close in prayer with Tim Logan. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, what a wonderful morning. Thank you so much for Jesus. And God, just, um, Father, I pray that you will help us to, to love the way he loved, to serve the way he served, and to forgive others the way he forgave. God, help us to see others through his eyes and not through the eyes of the world or through our, through our eyes that may be clouded. God, there's a special young lady I want to pray for also this morning. Her name is Maria, and she's from our Hacienda of Hope. And she will be with us uh, through, this, through this year. Thank you so much for her. God, I remember holding her in my arms as a small young lady. And God, just thank you for all that you have done in her life. Thank you for Jesus as he's kept his arms wrapped around her and continue to do that. God, as we leave here today, help us to be kinder than necessary. Because, Father, we don't know the walk that other people are walking through. We don't know the problems they may have or the struggles. But help us to always be there for them whenever we can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.